Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Good afternoon, or good morning, or (laughs) good evening, whatever it is where you are listening to this right now. I just like to say welcome. This is episode six of the Benzo Free Podcast, and it has been one crazy week for me around here. (laughs) This intro today is going to be a bit longer than normal, and for that, I apologize up front. There's a lot going on with the podcast, and I really want to share it with you, so you can kind of see maybe this new direction we're starting to take. Last Thursday, I finally launched the podcast. I never knew the amount of work that would go into this. Uh, those of you who host a podcast, I bow to you. Whew, this, this, is, this is a lot of work, and I am starting to understand it. But you know what? It's worth it. It really is worth it. Several of you have commented on it, and I really appreciate your feedback. Most of it has been positive. Some of it's been critical, and I love all of it. The positive feedback is essential. It warms my heart and motivates me to keep going. And the criticism is equally as beneficial. It, it tells me what worked and what didn't. I promised on the first episode of this podcast that I would be honest and objective. And I, I believe I even said <laughs> that this is me warts and all. Well, this is one of those warts. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that just a little bit here. Well, while I envision Benzo Free, the website, the podcast, everything... I see it as being this vibrant community organization with a whole team of people contributing to make it, you know, this shining beacon of support or something like that. But it's just me. I know I say we all the time, but it's just me. I do the website and the podcast, and I try to market my book as best I can. But I'll admit, marketing is not my expertise. I may have a lot of experience in database design and and even some experience in websites. When it comes to online marketing, I am a novice at best. I don't even like it, but it's part of the job, and it's something I need to do to let you know that this podcast, this website, even exists. But for now, Benzo Free is just one person, and that person is flawed. Like all of us, I'm going to screw up from time to time, so I hope you'll bear with me. But I tell you what, when I do screw up and you let me know it, I'm going to own it. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to fix things and try to make them better. So so from the feedback I received, here's what I've learned so far. Episode 1 and 2, the basics of benzos and my benzo story, were pretty well received. That was great. I mean, it tells me what worked, and trust me, getting the positive feedback was really nice to see. Episodes 3, 4, and 5, that three-part series on managing the fear, well, not so much. (laughs) And you know what? I can see that now. Have you ever worked on a project that you spent a lot of time on, invested every part of yourself in? And then when you presented it, the response was mm, lackluster at best. And, And when you took a look at it through your audience's eyes, you said to yourself, what the hell was I thinking? (laughs) Well, that's kind of how I feel about those three episodes. I was even tempted at one point to go online and remove them, but I didn't. That's not how podcasts work, and I'm just going to keep moving forward. The truth is, I'm glad this happened. I mean, for the first five episodes, I relied too much on my book. And that was a mistake. I, I didn't have any feedback yet, and I thought the book would carry over onto the podcast. I may have been mistaken on that one. <laughs> I also think I came across a bit self-centered and self-righteous. Well... Maybe more than a bit. (laughs) But that's not who I am, or at least not who I want to be. So based on the feedback, I decided to make some changes. 
That's the beauty of a podcast. I can change things on the fly. I had already pre-recorded episodes six and seven a few weeks ago since I was going to double up on episodes the second week. But you know what? They're now in the trash. I tossed them. I am starting from scratch and we're making some changes. And let me tell you real briefly what those changes are. First off, I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk all the time and I'm sure I'm not alone in that feeling. So we will be adding some interviews soon. Yes, we're getting some interviews. I've already been speaking with a few people about these. I'll talk a little bit more about this in our Q&A mailbag section coming up. But in addition to that, I also want the feedback from you more on the podcast. I want to hear your stories, successes, failures, and just stuff about what your journey has been like. We also made changes to our feedback forum. I've added a location field, which is completely optional, a permission checkbox, which would allow you to use your message in the podcast if you choose to, and you also don't have to check it, and your message will stay private. And I've also added some instructions for submitting audio content. Yes, we now accept audio content. So you can record your comment on your iPhone or any recording device, send it to us, and we can include it in the podcast. So if you have any feedback for us, please send it to us at benzofree.org slash feedback. We want to hear from you. I've also made a few changes to the format, and real quickly, here's what they are, and then we'll get moving on. Introduction is the same, hasn't changed. Q&A, I might be calling that mailbag now so that we also can include comments in addition to questions, but really no other change there. We've added a new section called Benzo News, and in this section I'm going to cover stories about studies, statistics, medical findings, um, Benzo community updates, anything related to Benzos and their effects. If you have a news tip for us, please send it to us. Another new section is Benzo Stories, and this is where I'm going to share short stories about Benzos. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to get more input from you, the listeners, and I'd like to share both audio stories if you want to send us a recording, or just send us texts and I can read your story. But I'm looking for your input here, so help us out. And then we have our feature section, the feature topic. This hasn't changed much, except I'm going to try to focus more on topics that you want to hear about, and less on ones that I just came up with. So today's topic is going to be dependence, disbelief, and the doctor dilemma. It's going to be a good one, so I hope you stick around for that. And finally, I'm dropping our closing, that moment of peace. I, I'm just not sure it fits with this new direction. If, if you enjoyed this section and you'd like to see it added back in, please let me know. I'm not saying it's gone permanently. I, just for now, I want to try this out. And that's a new layout. Our length might get a little longer. We might shoot more for 30, 45 minutes. Again, testing that out and see how we do. And of course, I want to just mention this before we move on, that the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. And that brings us to our mailbag section, um, formerly titled Q&A. Just one question today, because we have a lot of things to cover, and my introduction ran a little long. <laughs> Sorry about that. The question is, when are you going to have some interviews, as I kind of hinted at in the intro? This question actually came back in our feedback form. It's a great question, and it's something that's constantly on my mind. Inter interviews take work. It takes a lot of work to contact people, to get them to agree, to set up a time to record. On top of that, it takes technology. Um, most of the people are not in the same location I am, so I have to set up a Skype system where I can actually record Skype calls and record them in a, in a, with good audio quality and be able to transfer them over into my recording software and get all that worked out. That is something we are currently working on. We, again, me. <laughs> that is something I am currently working on. But I'm hoping to have it in place in a couple weeks. So yes, please hang in there. Interviews are coming. And now let's move to our new section, Benzo News. Just going to cover two items in this section today, again, because we have a great feature to talk about, and that's coming up real soon. First off, the first news item I want to cover is one from the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, or the BIC. They are currently supporting two completely separate surveys on patients' experience with benzos. One was posted on their blog back on August 21, 2018, and the other was posted February 13th of this year. Please check them out if you wish to contribute your experiences. They really need your feedback. The BIC can be found at benzoinfo.com, and I've included direct links to both of these surveys in our show notes. 
And the second news article refers to several studies that have been written lately about the increase of benzodiazepine prescriptions. One article in the JAMA Network's webpage, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, provides some startling statistics about the recent increase. The title of the study is Patterns in Outpatient Benzodiazepine Prescribing in the United States, and I've included a link to it in our show notes. From the years 2003 through 2015, prescriptions for benzodiazepines in outpatient treatment almost doubled. The rate of visits, which included a prescription for benzodiazepines, increased from 3.8% to 7.4%, and the increase differed dramatically by type of doctor. Visits to psychiatrists only increased from 29.6% to 30.2%, barely an increase. So most of the increase was from other providers, including primary care. And another alarming trend that this study brought forward was about what these drugs are being prescribed for. Historically speaking, benzodiazepines are normally prescribed for anxiety, insomnia, and seizures. But there's a new diagnosis which is dramatically increasing for benzos, and that is for pain, especially chronic pain and back pain. The authors of the study stated, quote, Moreover, as opioids lose favor among prescribers, we must remain cognizant that this might lead to increased use of other potentially dangerous drugs, such as benzodiazepines, especially because evidence for their use in conditions such as back pain is limited. End quote. There have been many other reports which have been released in the past month about this increase, and it can be quite alarming. And that sums up our Benzo News section for now. If you have a new tip, please let us know. And that brings us to another news section, Benzo Stories. This is where we'll listen to stories from you, the listener. Well, we we would if we had any, but since we don't, I'm going to tell you an anecdote. I'm sorry. I know I said I would try to talk less often, and I'm trying to, but I wanted to put something in here, and since I don't have that kind of feedback yet... I'm going to post in one of mine. This is just a quick anecdote. I hope it won't take too long. You see, yesterday I was out shoveling snow. We got about five inches. Um, It's not unusual for the front range of Colorado, of course, to get snow in February. Why would it be? (laughs) But I was out shoveling snow, and I started talking with my neighbor, Eric. And he told me about this charity poker game that night, which benefited his son's team. It sounded like fun, so I told him I'd go. I mean... I like poker, so why not? I had a great time. We were playing Texas Hold'em, which is pretty common for poker tournaments. I'm, I'm not a good player, not by a long shot. I, I know how to play, and I, I love the game. But I'm just kind of average. I mean, I play for fun. I really do. That's it. The first table I was at included Eric, my neighbor, and three women I'd never met before. Anne was new to the game and had, you know, the winning hands on her phone in front of her so she could check the order and know which hand, um, you know, was good and which hand was better. Um, This is not allowed, of course, in professional poker, but, you know, this is a friendly game and it was totally fine. She started out rough, but she started picking up steam as the night went along. Shelly and Eric, they were good but didn't quite get the cards they needed. Now, Mary, (laughs) who was on my right, she was the thorn in my side. She was definitely a better player than me and could read me like a book. But but the best part about that first table was it was fun. We laughed and joked and had a great time. We were just having fun playing poker, and that's why I was there. But anyway, I did okay, and I finally made it to the last table of eight players. This wasn't as much fun. <laughs> this is when we're getting into more serious poker. It's still a charity game. I don't, I don't even know what the prizes were. I'm sure they were at halfway decent, but nothing I was playing for. I was having fun. But most of the players at this table, they're serious players. By the time I reached the table, the blinds, which are the minimum bids, were very high, and my stress started to increase. Yeah, you can probably kind of sense what's coming here, can't you? I became quiet and really focused on my playing, try, trying not to give anything away. My, my chips were getting low, and I finally got a hand which I could go all in, which, which means I'm pushing all my chips in on this hand. I'm either out or I clean up. But my anxiety was rising, and I was trying to hold it in. Not very successfully. Under the table, my legs started to shake. And then my arm was twitching. 
most of the time I, I bet silently so I didn't have to speak, but when I did, I became tongue-tied. <laughs> I was sure everyone saw what was happening to me, but I guess they didn't. I, I won the hand and survived for another few rounds until I got knocked out. Still, no matter what I tried to do, I couldn't control my shaking, twitching, or my speech. I tell this story just to share a bit of what my life is like now. The bad news is I couldn't control my anxiety and it showed in physical manifestations. This never happened to me prior to the benzos. I never had this shaking. I never had speech problems like that. I'm four and a half years benzo-free and I still have symptoms. I hate it, but I do. But the good news is this. A few years ago, I couldn't even think about going to a poker game. I would either be in too much pain or just couldn't handle being around that many people. I can now tell my neighbor without even thinking about it that, yes, I'll play poker with you. It may sound like a minor win to you, but for me, this little bit of normalcy was a huge victory. Life is a lot better for me now, and sometimes I have to remind myself. I have to go back to the days of acute withdrawal and remember what it was like, and then remind myself how good things are. Yes, I still have symptoms, but I am much better. And that's it for my anecdote. I don't know if it was interesting to you or not. I'm sure I will hear about it and we'll find out. Let's move on to our feature. Our feature for today is dependence, disbelief, and the doctor dilemma. This topic was triggered by one listener's comment. I'm going to share it with you here, and then we'll dive in for the discussion. This is from Catherine. Her comment was quite detailed, and I'm going to include only some excerpts here. I want to thank her, first off, for reminding me of the struggles so many have experienced trying to get help during benzo withdrawal. She opens with, quote, I'm only starting to listen to the podcast. First of all, I highly commend you for doing what you are. After 37 years on benzos, as of July 26, 2018, I'm now free after a very long taper. I work as an admin in a group on Facebook helping others as best I can. Within my limited abilities, and mostly from experience, reading resources, and audio resources, as well as observations gleaned over a long period of years. I recognize the need for a disclaimer to protect oneself, but I am caught in a dilemma when it comes to saying work with your trusted physician. As those are few and far between, if for many, they can even be found. She continues by sharing her personal experience with doctors. And she says, quote, Most are sadly ignorant and only learning of the withdrawal, but still harbor doubt. Those who are aware and accept the problem aren't aware of safe tapering methods. I started tapering in 2011, along with some other prescription drugs, and it's been a minefield of narrowly and luckily avoiding a detox or too fast tapered dangers. I soon learned I need to keep what I'm doing between the online community and myself. I'm now 63 and loving life post-benzo withdrawal, but had I listened to doctors and worked with them, I can't begin to guess where I'd be in life. I question, in fact, whether I'd still be alive. And she also discusses the difficulties that we face when we try to help others. She says, quote, it's a dangerous assumption for us to think our doctors will know what's best, yet I recognize the need for protecting ourselves, those of us helping, from legal ramifications and avoiding giving what can be seen as medical advice. End quote. Again, I want to thank Catherine for her comment and for allowing me to share it here. I really do. This is a great topic, but a very delicate one, too, to be honest. Let me first address what she said about legalities. Catherine is correct. I am I'm limited in what I can say and share on this podcast legally. As I mentioned, I am not a medical professional, and this podcast is not medical advice and should never be substituted for it. Yes, it is true that I cannot advise anyone to disregard medical advice nor delay in seeking it. That being said, I would like to also say 
it is not just a legality in my case. I actually believe what I say in my disclaimer. Still, Catherine has done an excellent job of raising some very valid concerns, and we need to take a look at those a little more. The last thing I want is for you, the listener, to think that I am not empathetic to the difficulties that many of us have faced with doctors when we seek help with benzos. First off, for many of us, it was a doctor who prescribed the drugs for us in the first place. 90% of all prescriptions for benzos come from primary care providers. This was also true in my case. So it makes sense that many of us are having a crisis of faith with the medical community. And we have every right to feel that way. I visited about five different primary care doctors during my withdrawal. Only one was well-educated on benzos, in my opinion. Three didn't know a lot about withdrawal, but were at least willing to work with me. And one who told me to stay on the drugs wouldn't help. I left his office and didn't return. So I've had a mix of experiences. Fortunately, I am one of the lucky ones. Even though my insurance is very basic, I still had the freedom to go find another doctor. Some people are restricted by insurance and don't have this ability or, or don't have the time or money to try different resources or different doctors. I completely sympathize with these people. It is hard enough to go through benzo withdrawal when you have a doctor who will work with you. I can't imagine what it's like without one. The, the good news here is that even some medical associations are starting to see the severity of this problem. In an article by John Nash from the Daily Mail on May 22, 2017, he quotes Marion Brown, a psychotherapist working with the British Medical Association, who describes the issue with doctors and benzos this way, quote, There is a pattern in patients' notes where doctors don't believe that their withdrawal symptoms, such as pain, fits, and psychiatric disorders such as panic and obsessiveness, are associated with the drugs. All too often, doctors fail to take note of the fact they have been on benzodiazepines for years, end quote. The truth is, I spent a lot of time on some of the discussion boards, and I've heard the horror stories, and they can be horrible. Disbelief, denial, rapid detox, the problems seem endless. I wish that all doctors were properly educated on benzos and how to properly withdraw, but sadly... That is not always the case. So, so thanks to Catherine for her input, and I hope I've done it justice. I think this all really comes down to a point of opinion and more so perspective. And all I can do is share my experience, some experiences I've heard from others, and tell you what I think. That's it. Yes, I am limited to a degree in what I can say here, but despite my difficulties finding medical support during my taper, I'm very glad I didn't give up on trying. It wasn't easy, not by a long shot, but it was worth it. You see, I truly believe that most doctors want to help their patients. <laughs> that's how I feel about it. Perhaps I don't live in the real world, but that's my belief. The truth is, there are some amazing doctors out there who are our biggest champions. The first one that comes to mind is Professor Ashton. <laughs> if it wasn't for her manual, I don't know where I'd be today. And that's the case for thousands of others. Our professor Malcolm Later, who first raised the alarm about benzos in the 1960s. Or more recently, Dr. Christy Huff, who is not only on the board of directors of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, but she is publicly sharing her personal journey of withdrawal with Xanax. One thing to keep in mind is that doctors have their problems too. Now, I'm not trying to excuse our actions, but I think it's important to understand them if we want them to understand us, their patient. Litigation is a serious concern for most physicians, especially from drug-seeking patients. Most of us are not that, but they do face this every day. Also, most primary care physicians only have on average seven minutes per appointment to get to know their patients. And above all, there is just not enough ongoing training opportunities which cover the realities of benzodependence and withdrawal, although that is starting to change. It's like so many things in life. 
The fact is there are doctors who aren't educated on benzos or who won't listen to their patients or who try and withdraw them too fast. But there are also doctors who are raising awareness and helping their patients and supporting us through this ordeal. Yes, I was one of the lucky ones. I did find a doctor who would help me taper. But he wasn't the first doctor I went to. The first two doctors weren't much help or refused to help me taper at all. The one who did help, he told me I could stay on the drugs and that I didn't have to withdraw, but I changed his mind. What made the difference? I was educated. I had read the Ashton Manual and I knew how I wanted to withdraw, and I confidently and kindly and calmly told him. And you know what? He agreed to work with me. Here are my thoughts on benzos and doctors. Take it or leave it, it's just my opinion. I believe withdrawal from benzos is a complicated medical procedure and should not be done without the supervision of a licensed physician. Yes, I'm supposed to say that, but I also believe it. Benzo withdrawal can be a medical nightmare for some people. And to have a doctor to work with us who is sympathetic to our needs is crucial in my opinion. Not only did I need someone to prescribe tapered dosages, but even more so, I needed a doctor who knew what I was going through and could help me diagnose my symptoms, especially those, you know, five EKGs that I had. Now, now yes, some doctors are not well educated on this. I know. Trust me, I know. But in my opinion, who better to educate them than us, the patients? Sure, I'm probably naive and simple-minded on this one. But this has worked in my case and in many others whom I have spoken to. When I've had to switch doctors during my withdrawal, as I've done three separate times since I started my taper, I go on objectively and calmly explaining what happened to me and what my plan is. And they respond. At least they have in my case. In fact, I can count three primary care providers who have changed their prescribing practices of benzos because I was their patient. Because they saw what I was going through. I often even brought in a few pages of the Ashton Manual or an article from Alan Francis and left it with them so they could read. And it's making a difference. If I hadn't gone to these providers and helped them see the reality of what a patient in acute and protracted withdrawal really looks like, others behind me would have suffered. I made a difference. And hundreds of others out there are doing the same thing right now. Now, I know many of you are saying, but I can't even find a doctor who will work with me, let alone one who's been so wise. And I get that. That is a struggle. And I, for some of you, I, I know, I, I don't know if I don't know the answer. There is some there is some help out there, though. There are some resources. There's many of them. Um, the BIC has an article on their site titled, How to Find a Doctor, 10 Tips to Quit Benzos. And they also have a list of benzo-wise and benzo-aware doctors throughout the U.S. WBAD has the same. They have a list of doctors, and they have information to help you on your taper. And there are other sites. Links to these ones I've spoken about are in my show notes, so check them out if you need that kind of help. So let me close with this, and, and we'll, we'll wrap this up here. Sorry it's gone on for a while, but I did get kind of talkative today. <laughs> this is what I would do if I had to do it all over again. I'm not advising anyone on anything, but if I was going to go through withdrawal again, this is what I would do. First, I would educate myself on benzos. I would read the Ashton Manual probably twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, you know, 11 times, whatever. I would go online and read articles and board postings, and, and I would use my common sense to determine what is true. And I would develop a plan of how I would like to taper that I can take to a doctor. Second, I would speak with my current doctor or psychiatrist. I would see if I can work with him or her. I mean, we already have a working relationship, so better to start with somebody you already know. Third, if that doesn't work, I would seek out a benzo-wise physician. I would check out the benzo-wise doctor lists I just spoke about, or I would ask people on the boards if anybody knows of one in my area. And fourth, if that doesn't work, I would find one I could work with. Perhaps this person isn't well-educated on benzos, but if he or she is willing to listen, they may just be the doctor for me. I believe to solve this problem, we need to work with doctors. This may sound naive to some, but it's my opinion but that in no way 
means that I don't realize the nightmare that some of you have experienced trying to find medical support when you so desperately need it. This should be easier. Doctors should be better educated. I couldn't agree more. I hope this topic has been helpful in some way. I, I tried to be objective about the presentation, and I hope I succeeded. But either way, thanks for listening. Before we get to our closing, please bear with me for about 25 seconds for our disclaimer. Yes, that same disclaimer which triggered our featured topic today. <laughs> Here it is. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. Withdrawal, tapering, or any change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, theanodiazepines, or any other prescription drug should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And thank you for joining me today. We will be doubling up our episodes this week, so check back by the end of the week for episode 7. Thanks again for your support, and please, let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. This is D. See you next time.